Well, hello again, class. This is Professor Khan joining you once again. Um, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about cause and effect or causal argumentation. Um, this is the type of argument that you are going to be using in paper two, as well as paper three and certainly paper four. Um, so we will be focusing uh, our sort of our example uh, in this presentation on paper two on um, character and we'll be using uh, Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour as our example. Uh, but keep in mind that this method that we're going to dissect for you in this presentation, this method of argument and this way of organizing your ideas in your arguments uh, is something you're going to apply not only in paper two, but also paper three and certain. So just a very quick uh, bit of background here. Uh, in my comp one classes, I teach my students about a concept called stasis theory. And just in a nutshell, the idea is that um, if we are facing some sort of problem or dilemma and we're trying to figure out what to do about it, uh, the best way to do it, according to the theory, is that we walk through five stages of argument uh, in order to arrive at some sort of course of action that is going to address uh, whatever problem we're facing. Um, and the first stage is we need to determine the facts. So we argue about what are and are not the facts of our situation. At the same time, we also argue about the definitions. We try to define the parameters of our problem. Uh, then we move on to arguments of cause and effect and then arguments of value or evaluation arguments. And finally, once we've um, sort of arrived at answers to these other types of arguments, we uh, are able to tackle sort of step five of this process. And that is we start arguing about what exactly we're going to do, what, what course of action we're going to take. So uh, this stasis theory uh, is useful for a number of things. Uh, I think you'll find that, you know, even in your daily life, as you encounter uh, problems and challenges, um, that whether you know it or not, you, you walk yourself through these five stages of argumentation um, in, in order to, to solve your problem. Uh, but really what this, this theory, what this idea is good for, uh, for certainly for college students in composition classes at least, is it uh, sort of gives us the five types of arguments that, that we as human beings engage in. Uh, any type of argument that you care to make, any type of opinion that you uh, promote, any sort of claim that you make that, that you then need to support with evidence and explanation and so forth, um, is, is going to fall under one of these five types of arguments, either an argument of fact, an argument of definition, an argument of cause and effect, an argument of value, or an argument of action. Now, in my class, as we've said in previous presentations, we're working with uh, a literary theory known as formalism. Uh, certainly, uh, all five types of arguments, fact, definition, cause and effect, value, action, uh, all five types of these arguments are useful in literary analysis. Um, but cause and effect arguments or causal arguments are very prevalent, uh, very common in formalist arguments. In formalism, when we are dealing with a central idea, uh, oftentimes we want to examine how the story results in that central idea, how, how that central idea came about as a result of choices that the writer made when the writer was composing the story. Uh, and, and in order to do this sort of analysis, we rely quite heavily on cause and effect argumentation. 
again, all kinds of arguments are possible. And as I've said before, uh, formalism is not only about central ideas. Formalism can be about any number of things uh, as long as they relate to the form choices that writers make when they write. Uh, but for our purposes in this class, uh, we will be sort of settling upon uh, a streak of formalism or a type of formalism that really is concerned with the central idea of a story and how that central idea comes to be as a result of the various choices that the writer made. So when we talk about form choices in formalism, at least uh, regarding our work in this class, we're talking about the elements of fiction. And the, the elements of fiction is an idea that's ingrained in the, you know, the policy statement of the class. It's sort of uh, grounded in the mission statement of this class as dictated by the English department. Uh, and the elements of fiction are, you know, something very fundamental to formalist analysis of, of short stories. Uh, of course, you can have formalist analysis of poetry, and then you'd have the elements of poetry uh, or elements of uh, theater, elements of a play, elements of a screenplay. You know, there's all kinds of genres of, of literature out there. Uh, we're, we're focusing, of course, on the short story, the literary short story. Uh, and so the elements of fiction that we are really concerned with in this class are character and conflict. Of course, that's what uh, paper two is going to be all about. Um, the central idea, which we began tackling in paper one. Uh, setting, that's going to be paper three. Narrator and point of view, that's going to be paper four. Uh, and then we're just not going to have time to deal with all of these elements of fiction, but uh, we could write a little bit about tone, um, that's really the tone of voice of the narrator. So we'll talk a little bit about that in paper four. Uh, language, language choices, um, uh, language strategies, word choice, uh, figurative language, uh, metaphors, symbols, similes, um, all, all personification, all sorts of language uh, strategies that can be used in, in literary fiction uh, and then plot of course and that's something that we began tackling uh, in paper one as well so we're dealing with a number of these form choices a number of these elements of fiction this semester we won't be able to get to all of them and of course there are more than these seven so <clears throat> for now um, just consider that your thesis statement for your essays will be the central idea statement. Okay, we're going to be playing around with other types of introduction strategies beginning in paper three, but in every one of these papers, um, you're going to be having to um, arrive at a central idea statement for the short story that you are analyzing. And of course, for paper two, you're working on the same short story that you did in paper one. So you will have already written uh, a central idea statement for that story in paper one. And once you get your comments back for paper one, you'll kind of see uh, how well you did on that. And ultimately, you'll want to settle on a, a good quality central idea statement for, for paper two, of course. And that will be the same statement as your final draft of, of paper one. Um, this statement will serve as your thesis, OK? And this statement really takes the form of a claim of fact or a claim of definition. You, you are arguing that the, the central idea of the story is this. It is a fact that the central idea of the story is whatever it happens to be. So I think that's a good example of a claim of fact. Well, we might be able to think of it as a claim of definition. We're sort of defining what the central idea is. Claims of fact and claims of def definition can be very similar to each other and, and, and in fact sometimes interchangeable. Uh, so that central idea statement, because it is your thesis, is going to sort of set the tone for the rest of the essay. It sets the course for what follows. Um, this central idea statement is the essay's overall main point. It's the main idea. And the rest of the essay is going to be you arguing that that is indeed the central idea. And you're going to do that by examining how certain form choices, in the case of paper two, character and conflict, 
how certain choices made by the author help that central idea come about in the mind of the reader. So we call, uh, you know, the, the, the introduction to the paper is going to be the, the plot summary and the central idea statement, and then we move into the body. That's the main middle part of the essay. In the body, your ultimate task is going to is going to be to prove using causal logic and arg argumentation techniques that the central idea is valid by showing how the elements of fiction give rise to the central idea. Everything in the body of your essay must work to support this mission. Okay, and if you look back at the paper two instructions, these will look very similar to what I will give you for paper three and paper four. I break it down step by step by step. So there are certain things that you have to do in a certain order in order for the paper to work. Okay, everything in the body must work to support the mission of promoting and supporting the cause and effect relationship between the element of fiction that you're dealing with and the central idea statement. And if you do that, you're helping to support your thesis, which is ultimately a claim of fact that the story's central idea is what you say it is. If you end up doing something different in the body, in other words, if you sort of go off script and start writing about something else, then you're not really going to be uh, supporting the mission of the paper. You're not really going to be supporting that thesis statement. Now, I know most of you, probably all of you, you know, at some point have taken a class, uh, maybe even, uh, you know, a previous composition class in college or, you know, a literature class, an English class in high school where your teachers, you know, had you analyze and write about short stories and poems and such uh, in a variety of ways. I know that, you know, many of you have been, you know, written about symbols and interpretations of stories and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's good. I'm glad you took those classes. Those were helpful. But please always follow the directions given to you by the paper assignment. Follow the instructions step by step by step. You don't have to write the paper in that order but ultimately the paper needs to be submitted <laughs> with everything in that order, step by step by step, okay? We have a certain way that we're approaching short stories in this class. We have certain goals that we're trying to meet in this, in this method. Um, we are, we are uh, using a particular brand of formalism in order to write about the short stories. So don't fall back uh, into um, maybe things that you did in other classes, other other types of, of essay assignments that you've had in the past, um, those may not help you for, for this paper. So I think it's a good idea to maybe call up uh, in another uh, tab or if you have a printout of uh, the, the paper to assignment, uh, call it up on your phone or something and you can kind of refer to it as we walk through this presentation. Um, you know, step one, of course, is just your plot summary and the central idea statement. And that's stuff that came from, from paper number one. We're going to really focus our attention in this presentation on steps two and three. This is where we're dealing with the character, the main character of the story. So let's walk through an example of how to write out this kind of formalist causal argument uh, using Kate Chopin's story, the story of an hour. So let's pretend that we've, you know, we've already written paper one over the story of an hour. We've got the plot summary down. We've got a central idea statement down. And now we're moving on to paper two and we're going to start analyzing and writing about character and how it relates to the story's central idea. So we will be following the pie pattern in our paragraphs. And I highly recommend this in any paper, in any class that you're taking. Uh, the pie pattern, we've mentioned it before, the pie pattern, P-I-E, stands for point, illustrate, and explain. 
So the idea is you make a point, then you illustrate it with examples from the story. We call this textual evidence. And then finally, you explain yourself. You explain how that evidence from the story helps to illustrate the point that you made at the beginning of the paragraph. So think of your point as your topic sentence, the illustration as your examples in the form of what we call textual evidence. These are going to be quotes from the story. These are going to be paraphrases from the story. These are going to be quick summations of plot points from the story. Uh, and then you yourself will explain why you chose those examples to illustrate your point. You don't want to let the quotes, the examples, the illustrations explain themselves. You are the one who needs to ultimately explain yourself. Okay, so let's say that we have arrived at our central idea for Kate Chopin's story. Here it is. The central idea of Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour is that love, while generally considered to be a positive and sought after goal for most, can in fact lead one into a life of suppressed unhappiness until a life-changing event reveals the truth to that person. Um, this is one of, I think, many possible ways to formulate a central idea for the Chopin story. Uh, I will provide you with some other examples uh, on Blackboard and some other examples of central ideas from some other stories that we're reading as well, uh, just to give you some, you know, some other ex actual examples of central idea statements to, to help you uh, in your future papers. So, you know, take a look at this central idea statement um, and consider how it sort of reflects and tracks uh, Louise Mallard's sort of journey in this story, right? Um, she sort of began the story believing uh, that love was, you know, a good thing. It was a positive thing. It's a goal that people seem to strive for. Um, but over the course of the story, as a result of hearing about her husband's supposed death, uh, she retreats to her room and begins to contemplate that uh, love actually can lead one into sort of a suppressed life, a life where one sort of puts one's own uh, goals and uh, plans and motivations on hold. Uh, in order to accommodate another person. And this makes one unhappy uh, until, of course, some major event happens, in this case, the death of Brentley or the supposed death of Brentley, uh, which reveals sort of the truth. It sort of uncovers the truth uh, to this person. Again, there are other ways that I think we can formulate this, but I think this is a pretty solid example of a central idea statement for the story of an hour. Notice, by the way, that this statement, which of course would be our thesis for our paper, uh, this takes the form of a claim of fact or maybe a claim of definition, right? We're basically saying, and we're not, we're not writing this out, but we're basically saying it is a fact that the central idea of Chopin's story is this. Okay, so in step two, the first thing that we need to do is begin our paragraph with our point. Remember, we're, we're now following the pi pattern. So we got to begin with P, the point. And the point is basically the topic sentence of the paragraph. So it's going to go first. And we are simply going to say who the protagonist of the story is. So we would write, Louise Mallard is the protagonist. So that's what you're going to write for your paper two. You're going to determine who the main character is for Sonny's Blues or Paul's case, depending upon which story you wrote about. And you're just going to bluntly state in one sentence who that protagonist is. So go ahead and write that in your own way. But that is going to be your point, the overarching topic sentence for this first step two paragraph. And step two really only requires that you write one paragraph. 
although as I've said, um, you may choose to, you know, divide it up into two paragraphs just for the sake of, of ease of reading. You know, if your paragraph gets too long, if it starts taking up more than a page, uh, you might want to find a way to divide it up into two, and that's perfectly fine. Well, next we want to uh, dig into this l a little bit more, and we want to start defining that protagonist using some of the terms and concepts from the character um, video presentation that I hope you've, you've already, already watched. So these will sort of take the form of, let's call them sub points. They're not the main point, that which was Louise Mallard is the protagonist, but they're kind of sub points. So after we identify that protagonist, we're going to start applying certain definitional terms to that protagonist. And we're going to use terms like round and dynamic and flat and static. Uh, we need to address these sets of terms. But we don't need to stop there. We could certainly spend some time describing the character in other ways. Um, we could, you know, quickly summarize what the character looks like or what the, you know, character's general disposition is, personality traits, maybe some background. That's not the most important stuff, but there is certainly room for that if you'd like to write about that here in step two. Ultimately, you want to give textual evidence to support these descriptions. But again, our main goal is going to be to determine whether or not the character is round or flat first, and then whether or not the character is dynamic or static. So we're going to ask ourselves, is Louise Mallard a round character or is she a flat character? Remember, a round character is a character that has some depth to it, some dimension, uh, more than one side to the personality. Uh, maybe an, an interesting, complicated backstory. Those are all good signs that a character is round. Uh, if a character is flat, they're really a one-dimensional character. They really only show one side to their personality uh, in, in the, the, over the course of the story. And remember <clears throat> that um, typically we can find evidence of roundness or flatness very early in a story. We don't want to you know, wait until the last paragraphs in order to say, oh, the character's round or flat. We should be able to determine that relatively early in the story. So here I'm going to claim that Louise Mallard is a round character. And of course, I said this back in the character uh, presentation as well. And I wonder if you remember from that presentation what sort of evidence we called up uh, to support this claim, this sub point that Louise Mallard is a round protagonist. I don't think we got to all of these points, but we certainly mentioned some of these. Louise is a round character because she has depth to her personality. Now, the story of an hour, you know, again, is such a short story. But one of the reasons why it's still with us, one of the reasons why Kate Chopin is considered a great writer is because she is able to very economically capture a lot in those few paragraphs, those few pages that the story takes up. So I would say Louise is around and we have evidence of this. Uh, we're told in the first sentence that she has a heart condition Yet we're also told that she's very young. So, you know, that's kind of a juxtaposition for a young character to have a heart condition or heart trouble. We usually associate that with older people. That's an interesting aspect to her. Uh, she's married. Now, this is not certainly uncommon for the time period that she uh, that uh, uh, Kate Chopin is writing in. Uh, but I think that, you know, the fact that Louise is so young and she's married is an interesting um, fact about her. It gives her a little bit of depth. Uh, she's later described as having a fair, calm face, yet we can see uh, sort of a sense of repression and certain strength in her face as, as well. So the fact that she's so young, um, fair, calm face, that makes sense, but 
she also seems to be repressed and she seems to give off a certain strength. Well, we don't know all the details about that yet. Um, this is still coming at us fairly early in the story, but this is very interesting. Okay, now that those are just you know a few lines from the story, but everything in a short story carries some weight. So we can't breeze over those lines and just kind of throw them off as you know toss away sentences. Those sentences are very important sentences. You might recall that when um, Louise is told about Brentley that he's been killed in a railroad accident, that she weeps instantly. And the narrator sort of notes that this was unusual. Uh, usually, you know, when someone is given really tragic uh, news like this, um, you know, they begin walking through the stages of grief, right? And the first stage is disbelief, right? And denial, right? It's like, oh, no, there must be some mistake. Oh, no, that can't be true. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, that I don't believe that. Um, Louise doesn't do that. She instantly falls to weeping. So the narrator points this out and calls this out as being kind of unusual. It's not what most people seem to do. That's interesting. That is something about Louise that I think gives her a little bit of depth. And, you know, the story is ultimately never up front about why she does this, but I think we can guess after finishing the story and, and sort of understanding what, what Louise's journey has in, entailed. Uh, of course, later in the story, we read that um, Louise does love Brentley, but also not, right? <laughs> and we have this bit about, you know, how uh, when when she was with him and, you know, before he supposedly died, um, she uh, sort of feared that life might be long. And now that he has died, she is sort of looking forward to the fact that life might be long. Um, now, this information is it's true, it's sort of given to us kind of late in the story. And like I said earlier, we really want to look at the beginning of a story for evidence of round. Uh, but what we're being told here in this part of the story is that she's been thinking about this stuff all along. It's only now in the story that we're being told this, but this is stuff that's sort of been on her mind at least a little bit uh, prior to the events of the story. So I would call this evidence of roundness. And then, of course, this understanding about love and how love is all about, you know, another person sort of uh, bending your will to theirs and enforcing their will upon you. Uh, this is an idea that's been, I think, forming in Louise's mind. We're not getting that information confirmed until kind of late in the story, but this is something she's been thinking about kind of all along, and we're being told that here at this point of the story. So again, I think this is good evidence of her being a round character. So I'm gonna color code here, uh, and I hope that helps a little bit. Notice pi at work here. Now, now let me also say that, you know, in this presentation, think of, think of these slides as notes that, you know, I'm taking to myself. These are just notes that I'm just free, you know, free handing on paper or just tapping out in a, in a document. You know, this is just for me. I'm not gonna show this to my professor. This is just me gathering my thoughts together in preparation to start writing paragraphs. So consider pi, consider the pi pattern at work here. The point is in yellow, the illustrative evidence is in light blue and the explanation is in green. So my point is that Louise is a round character. This is sort of a sub point. Remember the main point is that she's the protagonist, but sub point, she's a round character. The illustration are the bullet pointed uh, sort of light blue stuff, right? The heart condition, young, married, fair, calm face, repression, certain strength, weeps instantly. Uh, loves Brentley, but also not. Life might be long. Love is another's will over yours. And my explanation would be that, you know, these facts about her, these qualities of her, um, express a certain depth to her personality. You know, she's not just a, a one-sided um, 
character. You know, she's got she's got these conflicting, somewhat juxtaposing ideas, kind of rat rattling around within her personality, and that gives her depth, and therefore that makes her round. Okay, so once I settle upon whether or not the protagonist is round or flat, remember, she can't be both, she can't be round and flat, she's one or the other, then I need to move on to my second set of terms. Is the protagonist dynamic or static? Dynamic, if you recall from the character presentation, dynamic means that the character goes through a substantial and critical, uh, meaningful change in some way by the end of the story. The character is different at the end of the story than he or she was at the beginning of the story. Uh, a static character is just the opposite, a character that really does not experience fundamental change over the course of the story. Well, I'm going to claim, as I did back in the character presentation, I'm going to claim that Louise Mallard is dynamic because she changes. Uh, things happen to her, and these things happen to her partially as a result of her round character, but also just the the plot of the story, the fact that she's told that Brentley has died, that sort of is the, the the thing that kicks off the journey, the introspective journey, so to speak. So I wonder if you recall from that character presentation, you know, what is it that we brought up um, that seemed to serve as evidence of Louise Mallard being a dynamic character? You know, Kate Chopin is is pretty pretty blunt about this, I think, uh, in the story of an hour. And this is one of the reasons why I chose this story to help illustrate uh, dynamic, the dy dynamic quality of a protagonist. Uh, Chopin has the narrator be very blunt about the fact that uh, Louise goes through a fundamental change in terms of her, her self-understanding. I would write that Louise is dynamic because she changes. Here's some evidence. She experiences that, quote, clear and exalted perception, that brief moment of illumination concerning life and freedom and love and self-possession and free will and these kinds of ideas. Um, you know, after uh, Josephine, I think Josephine comes to, to, to knock on her door and see how she's doing. She she walks out of the, the room and down the stairs with a, a sort of walk of triumph. She's, she's, you know, her back is straight. She's, she's looking forward. She's looking ahead to her life. Um, the narrator compares her to the goddess of victory, which is a very powerful mythological illusion or, or reference to a myth. Uh, the goddess of victory was a very proud, very powerful, strong female figure uh, with wings. Um, so here we're sort of comparing Louise Mallard to the goddess of victory, and of course, victory means to win, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, in the, you know, uh, twist at the end, and there was a time when stories were very much about the, the unforeseen twist, ironic twist at the end. We don't see this as much in more contemporary stories, but it used to be a thing. Uh, she dies, right? Brentley, turns out Brentley didn't die. He, it was all a communication error, and he walks in the door, and Louise sees him and dies instantly. So, of course, you can't, you know, you can't change much more than that from being hopeful and alive, looking ahead to your life, to suddenly dying. So, uh, dying is certainly a dynamic change, uh, but really the important part of that is that the reason why she dies, right? She dies because this this life that has opened up for her uh, has now been slammed closed. Like the door is slammed shut on that life now that Brentley is is no longer dead. Um, and you know, I've I've taught this story many times over the years, and uh, students uh, sometimes tend to uh, be a little taken aback by uh, Louise Mallard's actions. Um, it's very nuanced. It's it's very complicated. You know, Louise is not some. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it's unfair to say that Louise is some you know man hater who just you know hates uh, uh, the idea of being married. Um, she's a complicated person. She's round. She's, she's, she has multiple things going on within her. 
<clears throat> but ultimately she decides that living a life where she alone has the final say in what she does, um, that's what she's she's decided upon. And of course, now that that, that idea has sort of slammed shut on her, uh, her heart trouble uh, comes back to, uh, to haunt her and, and it kills her at the end. Uh, it's it's really it's really a very interesting story. Uh, Kate Chopin is is rightly considered you know one of our I think early uh, American uh, feminist writers, and uh, Kate Chopin led a fascinating life uh, in which she herself uh, uh, pursued freedom, um, and she certainly reflects that in, in some of her most famous work. So again, if we uh, color code this, uh, Louise Mallard is dynamic. There's her point. Uh, our evidence, the illustration, uh, the evidence that will illustrate this point is in blue in the bullet points. And ultimately, we would want to explain ourselves, not just in you know part of a sentence, but in several sentences, indicating that these bits from the story, these bullet pointed bits, um, illustrate change, illustrate meaningful, dynamic evolution and change in Louise Mallard's character. Thus, she must be a dynamic character. So basically, I'm just describing the character, okay? I'm, I'm identifying who the protagonist is, and then I'm defining that protagonist in terms of roundness and or flatness, and in terms of dynamic or static quality. And I can throw in some other things in there as well if I, if I choose, but I must tackle um, round, flat, and dynamic static as part of step two. I need to illustrate at all times by using textual evidence. Now, <clears throat> they say, you know, variety is the spice of life. I think I said this before. That means um, in terms of our writing, we want to try to use a variety of ways to provide textual evidence. Quoting is fine, but you don't have to quote every time. You can paraphrase. You can sort of put things into your own words. You can quickly summarize plot points, just like you did in the summary, the plot summary of the story. Uh, refer to specific moments in the story, so on and so forth. So just use a variety of ways to provide your textual evidence. Now, we're done with step two. Now we're going to move on to step three. We're still writing about character here. We definitely want to start a new paragraph here with step three. And it's in step three that we're now really going to employ cause and effect argumentation. So one of the keys to making cause and effect arguments stick is to use cause and effect keywords. Okay, uh, you know, I in, in comp one, I sometimes talk about cause and effect. Um, cause and effect, you know, really is a fundamental relationship that we see in the world we live in, right? Uh, we, you know, uh, lose grip on our, our coffee mug and the effect is it smashes to the ground and, and furthermore the effect is we have to now grab a towel and clean up the mess we made, right? Something happens which kicks off a chain of effects that we experience. Um, some phenomena, phenomenon occurs and there are things that happened before it that led up to it that helped cause it. So cause and effect. Well, if we're going to describe a cause and effect relationship, we really want to be using cause and effect keywords and phrases that emphasize the cause and effect logic, the, that, that causal relationship between between things. So here's a short bullet list of, of such words and phrases. Uh, make sure to you know use these in your cause and effect arguments. These certainly are isn't an exhaustive list of, of cause and effect keywords, but this is a good starter list. In step three, we want to explain how this character, this protagonist, contributes to the central idea. So we've just spent at least one full paragraph, maybe more, defining the protagonist, defining the who the protagonist is, but also uh, saying a little bit more about you know what type of character it is, what type of protagonist, a round protagonist, a dynamic protagonist, what have you. Now that we've done that, we want to take that information and connect 
our understanding of that character to the story's central idea. There are all kinds of things that are going to contribute to the central idea. Character is one of these things, and this is where we're going to try to make some of those connections made clear. So we're going to use cause and effect argumentation to show how this character and what we know about the character helps lead us to understand the central idea of the story. And we're going to use our causal logic and our cause and effect keywords to help get us there. So we'll begin step three, just like we did with step two with our point. Remember, we're following the pie pattern, P-I-E. So we'll begin with a point, that's our topic sentence. And that sentence is simply going to say that character helps cause the central idea. Put this in your own words. You could be specific. You could say, you know, the protagonist of Louise Mallard helps to create the central idea of the story. Or the nature of the protagonist helps give rise to the central idea or the central idea of the story is brought about in part through our understanding of the protagonist of the story. There's a thousand different ways to say this. Go ahead and choose whichever way you wish. Begin step three with this one sentence. This is the first sentence of the paragraph. The overall point I am now going to try to prove in the rest of the paragraph. Here comes the cause and effect logic. Now, in order to do this well, we need to remember our central idea statement. Now, the central idea statement was written at the end of the introduction. That's, you know, at least one, maybe more paragraphs back. Just because it's a little removed from step three doesn't mean that we can suddenly forget the story's central idea. We always have to keep it in mind. So remember, the central idea of Kate Chopin's story is that love, while generally considered to be a positive and sought after goal for most, can in fact lead one into a life of suppressed unhappiness until a life-changing event reveals the truth to that person. Let me point out that in this central idea statement, we're never making mention of Louise Mallard. We're not talking about Brentley. We're not mentioning characters' names. We're being a little general here, but we are using Louise Mallard's journey in that story to arrive at this uh, statement about human nature and the nature of love and things like this. We want to be referring back to this central idea statement in step three. We always want to be bringing our argument back to this statement. Now, that statement's kind of a long sentence, and it's got a lot of moving parts in it, right? If you remember the central idea presentation, we talked about X, Y, and Z, right? X is the character at the beginning of the story. Y is what happens to the character. Z is the character at the end of the story. We see that here. We have X. Louise Mallard, the character, is someone who thinks that love is, generally speaking, a good thing. I mean, she bought into it. She got married to Brent, right? Uh, but things happen. A life-changing event occurs. That's why. And then Z, it leads to a life of suppression. That is only, um, that one ultimately awakens from as a result of you know, the, the, the event that occurs. So we do have X, Y, and Z in here. It may not be the easiest thing to see, but it's there. Now, because central idea statements can be kind of long and have multiple moving parts, it might be helpful for you. It might not be helpful for you, you know, do what's good for you, but it might be helpful to kind of tear apart a central idea statement into its component bits and pieces, okay? You might remember I was saying uh, in the central idea presentation that uh, a central idea statement cannot simply be a theme, right? A theme is like a you know one word or maybe a short phrase. Uh, a central idea statement is usually going to be composed of more than one theme, 
and it's going to say something about the relationship between those themes. So take a look at how I've divided up this central idea statement into three parts. Love, generally considered positive and sought after goal. That's the first one. Two, um, love can lead one into a life of unhappiness and suppression. And then three, a life-changing event can reveal the truth about love and free will to a person. So these three bits, might we might consider them themes in the story. We sort of put them all together into this central idea statement. What we want to do is find things about the protagonist, traits, changes, motivations, etc things that we talked about in step two and we want to align those things with our central idea statement or at least parts of our central idea statement right the whole goal remember in this paper is to discuss how in the, if we're going to use the story of an hour as our example how kate chopin's choices in creating the character of louise mallard in creating the plot of the story, the things that happen in the story, how those things help us arrive at the story's central idea. I mean, in, in a sense, the central idea of a story is a foregone conclusion, right? It must occur. Our job is to backtrack and sort of um, reverse engineer this relationship and see exactly how that central idea came about at least in regards to character so that means once again we need to take information about that character that we dealt with in step two and align it with uh, connect it with the central idea statement and maybe not the whole statement but certainly parts of the statement that's why we divided it up into three parts. All right, the story element helps give rise to the central idea. That's our, our overarching idea. So if we consider this notion that love is usually a positive and sought after goal for most people, that's a, a segment of our central idea a statement what is it about the protagonist that might link to this idea? Well, Louise loves Brentley. She says so, or the narrator says so, I should say. Not always, but sometimes she loves Brentley. So it's state, stated right there that Louise does love Brentley. And she is married to him. She made the choice to marry him. Uh, she weeps for him. She grieves for him. Uh, she, and here's a quote, she knew that she would weep again when she saw the face that had never looked save with love upon her. So, you know, the narrator's telling us that Brentley, you know, Brentley was not, you know, he wasn't some jerk. Uh, he loved her. He, he wanted to do right by her. Um, and she's legitimately weeping for him. So there is love there. Love is part of the complicated equation of Louise Mallard. Yet she had loved him sometimes. So all of these bits are bits of textual evidence from the story that we could use to connect to this, at least this part of the central idea, this notion that, that love is a sought after goal. We see that Louise seemed to buy into that, at least to some degree. The fact that she, the narrator says that she loves Brentley, maybe not always, but sometimes that she's married to him and that she does legitimately weep for him. So here's our explanation, right? We've got our point sentence, right? The character helps give rise to the central idea. We've pulled out some textual evidence linking some information about Louise to 
at least part of the central idea. Now we could explain ourselves. This evidence here in the numbered list, this evidence shows that Louise is a character who, due to her personality, due to her beliefs, uh, at least once felt that love was a positive and sought after goal. So if we're going to have a central idea that says something about love being a positive goal, we in fact need Louise to believe that or to at least once have believed that in order to arrive at the central idea. If Louise never loved Brentley, if the story makes it clear that Louise hated Brentley and that's all she did, why then this notion about love being a positive and sought after goal for most wouldn't belong in the central idea statement at all. All right, let's take a look at this second sort of chunk or, or theme that we sort of excised from the larger central idea statement. This notion that love can lead one into a life of suppressed unhappiness. Well, what information about the protagonist, uh, stuff that we probably already covered in step two, at least in part, what information could link to this idea? Well, early in the story, you know, we're told that Louise had a look of repression and even a certain strength. And certainly I think by the story's end, we understand why she had that look about her. She was, whether she fully knew it or not, a little repressed by being in a relationship. Um, and yet she bore it. She had a certain strength. She comes to the realization, it's something that she's, I think, been considering for some time, this notion that love is all about a powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence uh, with which one, I'm paraphrasing now, with which one feels they have a right uh, to exert over another person. So even if that other person is totally in love with you, um, they are still going to exert a certain will over you. It's not just one person forging a life for herself or himself. It's two people and that involves compromise and so on and so forth. So that's the idea that Louise is, has come into in the story. Uh, she had feared life might be long. She, she maybe wasn't fully aware of it at the time, but she's come to understand that she was afraid that she might live a long life married to Brentley and living this compromised life. Uh, and then ultimately she has this epiphany and understands that now that Brentley has died, She's no longer in this compromised relationship and she has only herself to answer to for the rest of her life. And she thinks to herself free and she whispers it in fact, free body and soul free. So it seems to me that um, all of that stuff uh, suggests a life of suppressed unhappiness, right? That love has led people uh, into this kind of life. This evidence from the story, textual evidence, shows that Louise is a character who, due to her personality traits, due to her beliefs, due to the understandings that she has grown into over the course of this hour in her bedroom, um, this evidence shows that she is actually living or has lived prior to being in this bedroom, has lived an unhappy life that she has in fact sort of suppressed. And she sort of talked herself into thinking that it's a good life, but in fact, it's a life of suppression. We need Louise to think that way. We need her to act in this way. Otherwise, the central idea would not come about, right? If Louise had all along known in the, in the front of her mind that she was leaving, uh, uh, living a compromised life and that she was totally unhappy, the central idea would be a little bit different. 
we need Louise to be the way she is in order for that central idea to come about. And we want to track that and attach aspects of her character to the central idea statement. And that's what we're doing here in step three. Finally, we have this third sort of chunk that we sort of excised or, or took out and are considering uh, sort of separately from the rest of the central idea, this notion of the life-changing event that reveals truth to a person. So what is it about the protagonist and the story that links to this idea? Well, again, uh, the narrator is very direct about the clear and exalted perception. You know, that's really just a, I would say another way of saying epiphany, uh, the brief moment of illumination. This is another, I think, just another way of saying, you know, coming into a great understanding, coming into an epiphany. Um, Brentley's death or supposed death leads to these realizations, right? It causes Louise to run up to her room and, and meditate on these things. And it ultimately leads to her thinking free, 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 and free, body and soul free. Um, the narrator says there would be no one to live for her. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers and that blind persistence, et cetera, et cetera. Now notice we're using some of the same evidence that we have brought up before. That's fine. We don't want to repeat ourselves too much, um, but we can refer back to some of the same you know, bits of textual evidence. We may not want to quote it again and again and again, you know, quote it once and then just refer back to it again. You don't have to quote it a second time. Um, what could love, this is one of, one of my favorite lines from the story, what could love the unsolved mystery count for in the face of this possession of self-assertion? That's just a fantastic line. Uh, this notion that, uh, you know, Louise has a, a life ahead of her. She's a young woman. She has this long life ahead of her where she gets to call the shots, make the choices. She gets to live for herself. And that's, in her mind, at least, that's far better than um, being in love with somebody. So all of these things seem to suggest the notion that a life-changing event in this case, Brentley's death, can reveal truth to a person. Louise does arrive at these revelations, and she arrives at these revelations as a direct result of hearing about Brentley's death. That's the, the life-changing event that sort of acts as a domino, uh, falling domino chain, right, that leads to Louise's epiphanies. We need Louise to have these epiphanies as a result of hearing the news of Brentley, Brentley's death. We need that to happen in order for the central idea to come about. If Louise heard about Brentley's death, ran up to her room and cried, and then the story ended with her just crying and crying for Brentley, she misses him so, and then at the end he shows up and she's so happy to see him and they live happily ever after, that's a totally different story that would be a totally different central idea. So we need everything to be just so in terms of character, as well as other things, plot, conflict, setting, all of these other things, but we're just focusing on character now. We need things to be the way they are in order for that central idea statement to come about. And in step three, your job is to link those traits, those aspects of character to the central idea statement. You really want to be referring back to that central idea statement throughout step three. Don't ignore it. Don't, don't not bring it up. Always use the phrase central idea. Always refer back to parts of the central idea statement. You know, reword it in your own way if you'd like, but always be bringing it up and connecting it to character in step three. So overall, in step three, we're making the case that we need Louise to be the way she is and do the things she does and change the way that she changes in order for the central idea, as we have it written, to make sense. The central idea being that love, while generally considered to be positive, 
and a sought-after goal for most can in fact lead one into a life of suppressed unhappiness until a life-changing event reveals the truth to that person. So after we finish with step three, we move on to step four and five. Four and five are all about conflict, the primary conflict, right? We need to identify whether or not the primary conflict is external or internal, first of all, and then we need to determine what is versus what. What is in conflict with what? And if you watched the conflict uh, video presentation, you know, we talked about this. We talked a little bit about um, the story of an hour. And in that presentation, I believe I, I made the assertion that in the story of an hour, the central conflict is internal. Uh, <clears throat> there are external conflicts. But the primary conflict that the story is really focused on is the internal conflict within Louise Mallard. <clears throat> so we would say that. Uh, and then we would say that it is one way we could say it would be, you know, Louise's desire to be uh, in a relationship, her desire to um, be in love, her desire perhaps to follow what society sort of demands of her as a, as a woman, a young woman, her desire to live up to these expectations and to pursue these goals is in conflict with other desires within her, other motivations within her that are causing her to think that maybe love isn't all it's cracked up to be, that maybe the better deal would be not to be beholden to some love interest, not to be tied down, so to speak, in a marriage, but instead live life on your own terms. So there's a war within Louise Mallard, and these are the two opposing forces so we would need to say you know one side of her personality versus this other side of her personality and we would want to be very specific <clears throat> about what those sides are the final thing i'll say is i want to remind you about qualifiers and we first <clears throat> brought up qualifiers back in the central idea presentation um, you know the idea is that we're making arguments about art or making arguments about literature <clears throat> and uh, the uh, wonderful miraculous thing I think about art and literature uh, is also perhaps the frustrating thing about art and literature and that is it's ambiguous it can be read in more than one way and these competing ways aren't necessarily all better than the other they're all sort of equally valid so we as we argue certainly beginning in the central idea statement, but even in our, our analysis of central idea and its relationship to, to elements of fiction, we want to use qualifiers, right? The, the idea is that there's no one way to read or interpret the story. It's ambiguous. It's open to some measure of interpretation. So if we use qualifiers carefully, they can be very powerful. Uh, they're telling our readers that, you know, we're not saying this is the only one way to understand this. It is one possible way. But if we overuse them, you know, if we use more than one qualifier in every sentence, for instance, that is just going to make us sound too weak. It's going to make us sound like we don't know what we're talking about. So it is a, striking a fine balance between uh, using just the right amount of qualifiers versus overusing them. And again, I give you a short list of qualifiers, you know, really they're transition words and phrases that are helping readers move between ideas in our in our writing. So uh, I hope this um, helps. I know that was a lot of information, you know, probably be helpful to, to watch this presentation again. Uh, you know, always have the instructions open uh, take a look at the rubric, take a look at the sample paper. The sample paper will help you so much. If you look at it, read it carefully, follow it, and compare it to the instructions for paper two, notice how I'm moving from step to step to step, and notice what I'm doing in each 
component, each step of the paper, right? Each step has its own sort of mission, and altogether, all of these steps are working toward supporting the thesis, which is that the central idea of the story is what you are saying it is. If you have any questions about this cause and effect argumentation, please let me know. This is the same pattern we're going to use in paper uh, paper three as as well as paper four. Paper five is going to be a little bit different. We haven't quite figured out what we're going to give you for paper five yet. It's going to be a research paper, um, but we may include some some cause and effect argumentation in there. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But certainly in paper three, which will be about setting, and paper four, which will be about narrator point of view, you'll be doing the same sort of cause and effect argumentation, linking setting to central idea, linking the narrator point of view choice to the central idea.